We are going to be in James chapter 3 today for just a little while. Then we're going to jump over, over to Ephesians chapter 4 to talk about what James says in chapter 3. How many of you read the book of James chapter 3 this week? How many realize we all have a problem? It's our mouth. Say amen, church. Anybody, your mouth ever get you in trouble? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not where you say woo, okay? <laughs> Anybody ever been to prison? Woo! Yeah, <laughs> kind of the same thing. Um, how many of you are good at arguing? Say amen. Let me ask you another question. How do you know you're good at arguing? Is it because you win? Just hang on to that for a second, okay? Hang on to that, because we're going we're gonna to come back to that in just a little bit. Our mouth gets us in trouble. The, the, the text in James isn't going to be on the screen, so you're going to have to wait till we get to Ephesians. But James chapter 3, really the whole chapter, the whole chapter James starts talking about what we have to watch. In fact, the very first verse, he gives a very stern warning to the church. And he says, listen, some of you, brothers and sisters, some of you ought not teach. Some of you don't need to be speaking out about Jesus. And you go, wait, last week you told us that that was what we're supposed to do, whether we felt we were called to do it or not. I want you to understand what James is speaking about. He's not saying that you shouldn't. He's saying that some of you aren't ready yet. And then he goes into why, because he says, brothers and sisters, some of you ought not teach because there is a greater weight there is a greater weight that's attached to those that lead, those that teach. In other words, one day we will all stand before God at judgment. The Bible says that we will stand before God in judgment. We will give an account for everything that we've said. It's kind of terrifying, amen? Some of you are like, oh, snap. I wonder if you heard the ride to church this morning. Yes, he did. But as a leader and as a teacher, not only will we give an account, not only will I give an account for what I've said, but I will also give an account for those that God has given me. And so God's not, I get to run through my list of my stuff, but then he's going to say, oh yeah, Vince, I called you to lead. What did you do with Austin? What did you do with Briston? What did you do with Leah and Stacy? What did you do with them? Because I called you to lead and I gave you these gifts to lead. What did you do with them? And for that matter, James says, some of you aren't ready for this. Some of you are not ready for the wait. Every time we interview a pastor here at Real Life Church to come on an employment, it's one of the things I ask them. If it's a preacher, I ask them a very simple question. I say, can you preach? well, you know, and I'm like, no, no, I don't want humility right now. I want honesty. Can you preach? If I put you on the platform, are you going to proclaim the word of God as if it is born and it's what you bleed? Because if not, it's okay. We can work on that, but I need to know from you where you're at. The second thing is I ask this, do you understand the weight of what we do? That what we do is not about making someone feel good about themselves today or tomorrow in a counseling session. That what we do matters for eternity. That the decision some of you make today will not just change your afternoon and where you eat lunch, but it will change the next eternity of your life. The next million years of your existence. The decision you make today could affect that. And there's a weight that's attached to that. And so James references that, but then he gets into this passage about the tongue, and he, he compares it to a, to a rudder on a ship. He compares it to a, a flame of fire that overtakes a forest. He, he, he says some pretty intense things about our tongue, about our mouth, about our words, and I'm just going to pick up in verse 7 and read a couple verses before we jump to Ephesians, but this is what he says in James. For every kind, every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being, church say no human being, can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. 
And he's, that's pretty intense. And he said, here's why I say that. Because with it, we will bless God, our creator. But in the very next breath, we will curse those who were created in his image. It's, man, there's nothing, I mean, nothing else in our life gives us the ability to build something up and in the next breath, tear it all down. To give life to somebody through encouragement or to cut their legs off through criticism. And, and here's the crazy thing. All of you have access to it. All of, all of us have access to, to this tool, this, this, this asset if used correctly, but man, is it tough to use it correctly. Because like, how, how many of you ever said something and you're like, I can't believe I just said that? Self-control, out the window. I've even said things that haven't necessarily been mean. They've just been ignorant. I sat and looked at my wife one time and said, babe, I think our car goes farther when you put gas in it. <laughs> true, true story. I'm standing at the gas pump having this epiphany from the Lord. Huh. Jay. She's like, what? I said, you ever realize that when we put gas in the car, like it seems like it goes further? And she just looked at me like, oh. He's, he's broke. <laughs> she thought that that moment had finally happened. Like the pressure of this ministry just snapped me. Like, but then we were also in Walmart one time and I was looking at the dry fit stuff, like the Nike dry fit stuff. And, and I was like, I love the texture of that, that, those clothes. I said, man, I said, it's like, kind of like you're, like you're naked under your clothes. <laughs> and again, how many of you know that look? Honey, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're all naked under our clothes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, you know what I meant, right? You, I mean, it might, it's like, it like feels like I don't have anything on underneath it. She said, <laughs> you don't have anything on underneath it. <laughs> I walked out of Walmart proud that day proud that my wife sticks with me, <laughs> even after I have moments like that. Then there are times I'm mean. Man, times that just this ability to communicate. All, sarcasm is my love language. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you, know, some of you just were raised in that where like, like if, if somebody's not picking on you, you're questioning if they love you or not. And so like I have two brothers and, and like we love each other, but you'd never know it. Um, like I, if I called either of them from anywhere on the planet with a need, they would do their best to come help me. But face to face, they're going to go, man, time has been awful to you, fat, bald guy. <laughs> and one of them still has hair and he reminds me every day, every time we get together, he makes a hair comment and I got nothing like hair or a comment. I got nothing. I can't say anything back. And so like, I, I, so I understand, but sometimes that sarcasm isn't in jest and sometimes I find it as my default. And when I get frustrated, I bite with it. Anybody? I have my son Parker is, whew, he is quick boy. And I love it because I love humor. I, lo I love timing. I love good timing on a joke or, you know, um, last night we were at a dinner and my daughter said, I actually, I have an inability, like I, I can't hear moron. And then somebody said something and she said, what'd you say? And I was like, oh, that was good. I was so proud. <laughs> Now, we were with friends. It wasn't just like a random person. She said that too. But, but like, so my son Parker is super quick, but I'm having to go, Parker, 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 Parker. Listen, buddy, I need, you, 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 got, you got too much, too much. It's too fast. And, and sometimes you have to learn there's a filter. That you, gotta, you gotta stop it. He's like, why? I said, because if you don't stop it, I'm gonna knock your teeth out. <laughs> now, I would do it in Jesus' name because I love him, but like, <sighs> Stop. And so he's at that age where he's learning timing. Like, this is the right time to make a joke to mom. 
And this is the wrong time to make a joke to mom. A few months back, there was a TikTok thing going on, and my kids thought they would try it on me. Since I don't have TikTok, I don't see this stuff, so I'm an easy target. We're sitting at dinner, and my oldest son, I sit down at the head of the table, and my wife's sitting right here next to me like we eat, and my oldest son is sitting here, and the other kids are at the table, and my son sits down, Braden sits down just as I pick up my fork in this hand, and I have my fork like this, getting ready to dig into my food, and Braden sat down, and Jennifer said something, and Braden said, shut up, mom. Instinctively. My fork hand went like this. And all I could do is I felt myself getting red. And I started to turn my head. And my son pushed back from the table. One of my sons was hiding in the bathroom because he was afraid of what was going to happen. Literally, he was waiting for the moment to be over. He's like, I wasn't coming out. I wasn't coming out. I'm like, why? He said, someone's going to die. Because <laughs> I can handle a lot of stuff, but that's not how you talk to mom. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Wouldn't matter. If it was my mom sitting there, I would have been the same thing. But, and so he said it, and Brain's like, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. Come to find out, they had strategically set up a camera on the stairs. The child at the end of the table had her phone. I thought she was checking a text, and she's videoing me the whole time. Your words, I, they, those, they're words. That's all it was. It was three words. Shut up, mom. And I went great white. Like I blacked out. I was going to kill somebody and my own offspring. And, and I would have had to done this funeral. And it would have been awkward. But, <laughs> but in Jesus' name, I'd have killed him if I'd have caught him. Uh, but so our words, can, they have that effect. And James here goes, hey, these words have an effect. And so I want to just talk with you. Earlier I asked how many of you are good at arguing. Some of you raised your hand. Some of you didn't want to admit it because you didn't want to start an argument because you didn't want to have that ride back from home or ride back to home. So you think you're good at arguing, huh? And then it started all over from there. But here's the reality. You are always going to have conflict in your life. Whether it's in your marriage, whether it's with your kids, whether it's at work, whether it's wherever it is, you're going to have conflict. And so I want to give you some tools today from the Bible, from the book of Ephesians on how to deal with this conflict, how you and I as believers, as Christians ought to act. You say, Pastor Vince, I don't think I'm a believer. Then listen, there's, there's some good principles today. And I hope that in the principles today, you, you get introduced to somebody named Jesus. Okay. That, that's why we do this. As much as I love sharing some of this stuff and as much as I like the church to grow, I want you to know Jesus if you don't know him. And so I pray that you hear him in today's sermon. So Ephesians chapter 4, picking up in verse 25, Paul's writing the church there and he's going, listen, there's a way to handle things. And, and so let me walk you through it. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. For let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Verse 29, let me slow down on this. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So real quickly, I'm going to try to give you four things today. And so we're going to have to rush through some of it, but I want to give you four things, four tools, things that you can do and how to, how to work this thing out with your mouth, because your mouth is going to get you in trouble. All of you have already admitted to it. And so let's go ahead and start. First thing I want you to do is learn to be honest. Church say, be honest. It sounds like a simple thing. It sounds like a simple thing, but you're going to have to make a determination in your life because you're probably one of two kinds of people. You are either a truth teller or you are a peacekeeper. 
if you are a peacekeeper, sometimes, sometimes for the sake of no conflict, you won't speak honestly. Sometimes for the sake of just not having to walk on eggshells, we'll just let it go. When what the situation really needs is an honest conversation. I tell people this in marriage counseling all the time. One of the things I tell them, I say, you need to set up a safe place in your house. Just call it the table. I don't care if it's actually at a table. Where it happens doesn't really matter, but you need to have a safe place where you can say, hey, can we go, can we go sit at the table? And what that means is that means, hey, we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation and no one's yelling, no one's screaming, no one's losing their stuff. We're just having a conversation. How many of you are able to do that, to have a conversation without getting emotionally involved in it? That's about how many hands I figured there'd be, all right? Most of us aren't because we get so attached to the reality in our own minds that we are right. How many of you are good at being right? It's okay. It, yeah, there you go. I got, got an applause on that one. Most of us, when we're right, we're good at it. What we're not good at is being wrong because we don't like that. I, I, don't, I don't like being wrong. I know there was somebody in the room that just said, I wouldn't know what that's like. <laughs> and if you heard them, you're going to want to just slide a few seats away. All right? <laughs> no, because the reality with this idea of being honest is truly something that you have to dive into. Are you a truth teller or are you a peacekeeper? Now, truth teller doesn't mean you do so in arrogance or cockiness. You don't, you don't, you don't, you're not a truth teller if you're continually adding, I told you so at the end of it. You're just a nag if that's what you're doing. The Bible is very specific on that. The book of Proverbs, there's a story and the verse goes like this. It is better to sleep in the corner of your rooftop than in the house with a nagging person, okay? That's what the Bible says. And so be careful in how you tell the truth. It's a critical thing to be honest, to have conversations. You also have to determine with what you're dealing with. Is it a fact or is it your perspective? Because some people go, I think that person's ugly. That's perspective. That's not a fact. That's relative. It may not be the truth to everybody else in the room, just you. And so you have to go, am I, am I about to tell the truth or am I gonna, getting ready to tell my truth? Because those are different things. And so be honest. Look to the scripture. Go, God, how do you want me to handle this? He wants you to always be honest. The verse here really is speaking about the relationship in the church about, to its brothers. I love good, healthy relationships where you can come to me and go, hey, this is broken or, or this is what I saw. Can we speak through it? Absolutely. I, I love that. I very rarely get offended by things. There are people that love my preaching and people that hate it. And they still come to church here. And you go, why would they do that? Because the mission is why we do this. Our preferences don't matter that all, all that much when it's real, when the commitment is real. The mission is what matters. And so be a truth teller, be honest. This, this statistic, the, the day America told the truth, written by James Patterson, he says this, 91% of Americans lie routinely about matters that they seem is trivial. 91%. One out of three lie about important matters. 86% lie on a regular basis to their parents. 75% lie to their friends. Seven out of 10 married couples lie to their spouses. Seven out of 10. That's quite the number. And so this idea of being honest, we go, well, but, but if I'd say what I'm really feeling, one of two things is gonna happen. They're going to get defensive or they're going to get pouty. And I don't want to deal with either. I don't want to fight. So if they get defensive, then I'm not going to be able to just have a conversation about it. If they get pouty, uh, that just frustrates me more. And so both have to learn to come to the table and go, 
how do, how do we do this? How, how are we going to get in a place where sometimes if I, if I mention something, it's not an attack, it's an observation. And can we walk through the observation together to make sure that I'm seeing it right and you're seeing it right? Or that we're seeing it on the same page? Being honest takes work. It's not natural to us as human beings. Our first natural response is self-preservation. We want to preserve ourselves. And so if we feel threatened in any way, we will go into self-preservation mode, but sometimes that doesn't mean honesty. And God wants us to be honest with each other. Spouses, kids, tell your kids, be honest with them. Sometimes I've had to look at my kids and go, I messed that up. I messed that up. And it's okay to do that with your kids. Second thing I want you to do is not only be honest, but I want you to be angry. Say amen. How many of you are like, finally? (laughs) Woo! I've been waiting for this one. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, how in the world do we do that? Anger is an emotion. It's what behavior follows your anger that becomes sin or the intention of your anger. The root of your anger can be sin. But it's okay to be angry. How many of you know the people that you love the most will frustrate you the most? Oh, man. Jennifer and I have been married 25 years in October. And I am amazing at frustrating my wife. It's a gift. It really is. I don't think she sees it that way. But it's a gift. Now, here's the thing. There are things that she does that frustrates me, too. It's, it's, it's just real. And, and most of you married couples, you can could, you could testify to that. You go, man, I love her. But good grief, when it comes to this, she really frustrates me. And so we have these realities. It's the same with kids. How many of you got kids? And those kids, man, they are blessings from the Lord. But also at times they are demons spawned from hell. <laughs> right? I, I, and you're like, no, children are a blessing. They are until they forget that you're the parent. And then you're like, I, I don't know what to do. We should just leave them the house and go away. <laughs> Some of you are like, can I admit that in church? Yeah, it's okay. Safe place. And so you, you have these moments where the people that you love the most frustrate you the most. They, they irritate you. And you go, can I be angry? You can be angry, but sin not. There's a way to be angry. There's a, there's a process in being angry and not sinning. You, you're going to be frustrated. It's, it's like temptation. Temptation is going to come. You are going to be tempted. What you do with that temptation is where it becomes sin or not. Anger is going to come in your life. You can be angry, but do not sin. You say, how do I do that? The Bible gives you, be, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Oh, Pastor Vince, I've been up 37 days. <sighs> I don't think I can take it anymore. Let me set you free on this. Sometimes people read this and they go, we're supposed to resolve every anger, every issue. No, it says don't be angry when you go to bed. It doesn't mean the issue is resolved. It doesn't mean that you've remedied the entire situation. It means you've got past the emotional part, and now you can really handle the thing. But you may need to rest before you handle it. And so be angry. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't don't let the sun go down on your anger. If you go to bed and you're angry, the Bible tells you very clearly what happens next. For if you do, you give the devil a foothold in your life. You basically open the door and go, hey, come on in. No, it's cool. I'm already stressed. I'm a little bit ticked off at the world right now, and especially at that person right there. So if I could just go to sleep and fester in it for a little while, that'd be awesome. Or you get to a place where you go, hey, I'm really frustrated by this, by this, but not by you. And we need to handle this, but I love you. Doesn't mean it's resolved, just means there's not anger and resentment and bitterness between the two parties. So be angry, but don't sin. Go to the table have a conversation, look each other in the eye, love each other, because here's the deal. If you truly love each other, love works. Okay? 
And when I'm talking about the verb, I'm not t- say, giving you a statement to put on a coffee cup. Love works. No, love goes to work. L- love has to be active. It has to, to work. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't. And so when we think about this idea of being angry, I, I want to give you some pointers real fast if I can just to help you in some of it. Uh, one of the things that I tell people often about anger is that we sometimes trap ourselves with statements that we say. And so one of them is simply this, and, and, and I'm going to get to it here in a second, is that you're one type of person or the other with anger. How many of you are bottlers when you get mad? Like you pack it away, you put it away, I'm burying this, I'm putting it away. Oh, I'm so mad, and I'm going to put it over here, and I'm going to put it over here, I'm going to put it over here, I'm going to put it over And then everybody knows what happens when you do that, right? the most random thing in the world will cause your head to blow off, right? Like you've been putting it away, putting it away, putting it away, putting it away, and all of a sudden, the mailman or the paper boy throws your paper in the neighbor's yard, and you go burn the neighborhood down because this happened, right? You're like, what are you doing? And everybody around's like, what just happened? Okay, that, A, is not healthy for you or anybody around you, Because if you're a bottler, what you create for your home and for your surroundings is this. Everybody's walking around you like this going, if I just push the wrong button, the whole thing's going to blow up. How many of you close doors in your house by making sure that you got the handle and you're you're, you're bending the handle before you get it to the latch and then you're quietly making sure it latches and you're backing away from a door. Anybody like that? Anybody lived in that situation? That's because you live with a bottler and you're just waiting. Second type of person is a spewer. You don't, you don't bottle anything. You go from zero to warp seven in a matter of seconds. And the reality is it's just God wants you to express your anger. He just wants you to do it in a healthy way. You can express what's going on in your heart and in your mind in a healthy way. But it's a choice. It's a decision you have to make. It's, it's bottling and spewing our, our reactions. They, they're like the doctor hitting you in the knee with that hammer and you can't help it. You just kick. That's a reaction. But when you express it, it's a, it's a response. It's, it's something that comes from your heart. It goes through your brain and then out your mouth. And you go, hey, I want to do this in a healthy way that matters, that helps us both. Can we express what's going on right now? Yeah, we can do that and it's the best way to handle it. So be honest with each other. Be angry, but don't sin. The third one is so simple, yet so complicated. Be kind. Look at the person next to you and go, you're awesome. I <laughs> uh, love my, one of these days, Scott, I'm gonna write a book that's called From the Pulpit. Because I get to watch all of you do that. And there's always that one person that's sitting on an end, and about the time they turn to tell somebody they're awesome, the person on there looked the other way. (sighs) And that's what they get. Be kind. In being kind, you have to understand a couple things, that God made us each different. Say amen. He made us different, and it's a good thing that he made us different. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. I want you to catch this, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, according to their needs. Wait, 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 wait. The conversations that I have, yep, are supposed to be intentional at building up the person I'm talking to. Yep. Yeah. If you go ask my wife, I would, I would even put this challenge out there to you. Some of my kids are in this service. If you go ask my kids, who is the most important person in my life? Jennifer will go, <laughs> well, he's going to say it's me. My kids will go, Mom. Now, they don't doubt that I love them. 
but I, and I'm not trying to be mushy when I say this, but she's the air I breathe. I love her like crazy. And I drive her crazy. Being kind is not a complicated thing. It ought not be a complicated thing. The problem is the more comfortable we get with people, the less we challenge ourselves to be kind. And we get comfortable and then we just spout things off like, well, they're going to love us anyway. What that is, is you taking for granted the gift God gave you. That's what that is. Yeah, but it's just my personality. No, stop copping out and own the fact that you're just being lazy in the relationship. You're just not taking the time to go, no, 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 wait a minute. I love this person. I can be kind. A couple of things. In showing kindness, here's one of the ways that you can argue. Two things people... This never happens, and it's this. Nobody that you have ever met in your entire life, always or nevers. Always, you always do this. No, they don't. You never, yes, they do. Did you take the trash out? That's a really broad question. But yes, I did. March 30th. 1997 I took the trash out that's not what I meant then don't ask it broad you never take the trash out March 30th yes I did say Vince that's ridiculous no what's ridiculous is that we accuse we accuse with falsehoods remember be honest if you'll slow down and actually think about the words you're saying so that they're honest You won't be near as emotional in the discussion and you won't accuse falsely. I don't care who you are. If you are falsely accused, it sets it off in our mind. We get set off. If you accuse me of something that I didn't do, I'm already on the defensive. So I got to be honest first because I'm about to be angry. The way God says, be kind. And so no one always or never. Second thing I want you to see about being kind is this. It's not always, always or never. Sometimes people are just different. Just different. God made you different from your spouse. It's why you love them. No, I need them to be more like me. Then you don't love your spouse, you love you. And that's weird and unhealthy and selfish. Jennifer and I are so, so different. So, so different. Me and my kids are different. So funny. My kids now, I jokingly say that, I said this in the first service and I never thought about it this way, but Jennifer and I have sets of kids. We have, we have a bunch, so there's six of them, but we have sets. We have like an Old Testament set and then we have a New Testament set that happened. Okay, and so like my Old Testament set, Vanessa, Kaylee, and Braden, they, I get, they get so frustrated watching us with the New Testament set. But I'm like, listen, here's the thing, because they'll say things like, if we'd have done that in a restaurant, you'd have beat us all the way to the car. Can I get an amen? (laughs) I was asking my daughter who's going, that's that's right. But see, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing now there were moments when they were kids that I disciplined them more out of my frustration than their need for discipline. And really what the issue was that they're wired different than me. And so they didn't know what they did wrong. I was just frustrated in the moment. And so I'm trying to do better at that. Now, my New Testament kids still need drug to the car from time to time. The reality is sometimes we got to grow in this. You have to grow in this. You have to be different. There's a great country song out right now, and I don't know the title of it, but one of the lines in the song, I'm about to preach a country song. Lord, you know where I'm going. But one of the lines in the song was, you didn't need more, you just needed different 
And man, it hit me so hard in thinking about relationships, whether it's with your spouse or your kids or your coworkers. Sometimes we keep going, man, if they would just give more, if they would just give more, if they would just give more. And it makes no sense because more of what you're asking them isn't in them. What you need to accept is that it might just be different. You may, you're going, I don't, I don't understand. Let me walk you through this. Maybe this will be more tangible. How many of you know how to load a dishwasher? Say amen. How many of you would also admit that no one else in your home knows how to load the dishwasher? Let me tell you how everybody else in your home is thinking. I thought the goal was to just clean the dishes. I thought that was what we were trying to do. However they go in the racks, so long as they come out clean. See, it's just different. Both are good. It's just different. Some of you have so much control held in your hand about how that you're missing out on the what and the valuable things in your relationship. If you'd just do it this way, it'd be better. No, if I did it that way, I'd be you. And that's not how you get an us. Two become one, not two become you. That's not how God planned it to be. So understand that God made you different than the people around you. Your kids are different than you. Your spouse is different than you. Their coworkers are different than you. Learn who they are. Learn, take the time to learn who they are and build into them. Third thing, be confident in their abilities, their abilities. You, you want to, you want to build somebody up? You want a healthy relationship? Be confident in what the other person is bi- built to do. Jennifer and I walked through this as a struggle early on. Let me just go ahead. I'll confess this again. It's getting easier as I get older. I am not a handyman. I can't fix anything but scrambled eggs I'm learning coffee, but that's really about it. In my home currently, I have three ceiling fans in different states of completion. In my home, over my kitchen counter, I have a light fixture. Two of the light fixtures have been changed. One remains steadfast. I believe we're going on year four of those lights. Listen, here's the, here's the disgusting part. The light fixture that's different is sitting 15 feet away from where it's supposed to go, still in the box. I just haven't done it. I know, fellas, men in the room, let me just clarify something for you. Do not go to my wife after this service and go, hey, if you need me to come by and handle that stuff for you, I will. Because all you're going to do is start an argument in my home. And there's a Bible scripture that says, touch not God's anointed. I will come after you. (laughs) It's a good place to pause, Jared. Good place. I needed that. I needed that to land. All right. There you go. There you go. (laughs) No, it's okay. It's okay. I, I know what I'm good at. Jennifer knows what I'm good at. We quit arguing about that stuff. Sometimes it frustrates her because she don't need me to fix it. Sometimes she just needs me to be the person to call somebody to fix it. There was a time that she was like, when she says, would you like me to call so-and-so man to come fix this? I don't want you to call no other man. What are you talking about? I'm still a dude. So now, hey, do you you want to handle that? I'll figure it out. Here's the thing. One of these days I'm going to stand before God and what I know he's not going to go is, you know that light fixture in your kitchen? Yeah. Didn't get fixed. No. But man, there was a bunch of people met Jesus because the time I worked on stuff that I was good at, things I am gifted at, talented at, and I'm okay with that. Guess what? She's okay with that. My wife's okay. My kids, I don't think any of my kids have felt slighted because their dad doesn't know how to work on the lawnmower. In fact, they're probably really excited I have somebody more our grass for us because I know what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. Do you? Have you taken enough time? Because here's the reality about relationships. Until you take enough time to get to know you and how you're truly wired, 
you trying to pour that out to somebody else is not going to go well. You're going to have to take some time and get to know who you are in Christ and go, God, fix me, heal me, change me, because that's what's going to lead to the last thing. And the last thing is this, be forgiving. Ephesians chapter four, verse 32, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. You need to remember that the goal is not, here we go. How many of you said the reason you know you're good at arguing is because you win? Here's the thing. If you see arguments and wins and losses, everybody in that argument loses. Everybody in that argument loses because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk down. You got me? Okay. As I walk and if, if Kaylee and I are in an argument and at the end of that argument, Kaylee goes, I won. I got him. And she turns and she high fives Josh because she won the argument. Nobody wins the argument. That's not what arguments are for. That's not what conflict is for. Conflict is not for me to go, I just defeated you in this conflict. No, conflict is going, how do we get to the place where we walk together again? The purpose of conflict is to reconcile, not to win. That's the win, is when we come back together, not when one of us celebrates the victory. So, thanks, Kaylee. We're good, just so everybody knows. So, and so often in forgiveness, we, we stop. Because it's the same thing. People keep going, man, I, I want to meet Jesus. Why? Because I want to get to heaven. 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 Here, do you understand that your forgiveness is not just about you getting to heaven, but so that you will know and learn and live and how to function here while you're still here? That the grace of Jesus Christ was not just about some eternal streets of gold mansion, that it was so that you would know how to love the person next to you correctly? All of that's included. But if you don't get to the point of forgiveness and going, God, I need you to forgive me so that I can forgive others, so that I can learn how to live in this life in peace. It's a big step. Be honest. Be angry, be emotional, but don't sin. It's how God wired you. Be kind to one another. Love one another. It's a simple word. Be gracious and forgive. Forgive one another as Christ forgave you.